welcome and on behalf of stephanie reinhardt um to the extent that she would allow me to say welcome um i know that she would say things uh that are true to her and she is very excited about the the new year um and she she gets really invested in the key picky um success and wants to see you all do really well um questions are welcome uh even if they may seem challenging um, to her team, uh, you can let Kitty or Alexis know if you have any questions um, related to your your grant, especially um, on the fiscal side of things. Um, Stephanie also uh, offers a lot of trust for the KPICI training team, KBC training project team. And um, I think that, uh, yeah, she, she knows that you all are in very good hands today. So um, aside from mine. But this is our agenda for the day uh, or for the morning. Uh, we won't keep you here all day. Um, we'll give a little bit of an overview of the Kansas Prevention Collaborative and the, sc uh, the scope of work for the Cape Hickey projects. Then we'll talk uh, a little bit more specifically about reporting requirements and the reasons why those are important. KCTC is Kansas Communities That Care uh, overview and coalition capacity survey, community checkbox training, and then we'll wrap up with a closing. These are our new planning cohort grantees. So you may hear yourselves referred to as planning grantees or cohort eight. Um, those are things that will stay with you uh, this year and um, then we, uh, we're planning for you all to be successful and we're all invested in, in your success to, to move into an implementation phase um, in future years. But um, the names on the screen, if those are not correct or not what your coalition will go by, um, kind of in public and uh, we can share the names as you would like them to be shared in, in our messaging as well. Um, so, it's great to have everybody here that's listed um, from our planning grant. So without further ado, as soon as she gets here and audio connects, I will. Hello, I apologize to you all. <laughs> um, my name is Stephanie Reinhardt. I'm the Prevention Program Manager at KDADS. I want to welcome you to your first orientation for the KPICI program. We welcome the newcomers to the program, and we also welcome any of you that decided, hey, I'll go through the orientation again um, for those that are continuing with us um, in this program. So to catch us up to speed, Chad, is this is my slide, and you're ready for that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. So at KDADS, uh, we have our Kansas Prevention Collaborative Program. In this program, we support you all in all the work that you do in your communities as it relates to substance use prevention and mental health promotion. And within this program, KDADS is the funding source and the single state authority for prevention in the state of Kansas. Through the partnership of these four organizations, um, we create this foundation for you to learn and grow in your areas in the hopes that when you graduate from this program that you would have gained some experience, some education, some knowledge and sustainability to continue your program after you've completed KPICI. So we have DECA, the Learning Tree Institute of Greenbush, KU Center for Community Health and Development, and WSU Community Engagement Institute. And uh, they will all be speaking um, about their roles as the day goes on. So um, as you can see, we are um, located, <laughs> we are located throughout the state and uh, DECA is our training and technical assistance um, partner that will be working with you um, in your specific areas. It has listed above the individuals that are assigned to those areas. 
And um, as you can see, we cover the entire state and our overall goal is that we will have a coalition in each state. So again, as I mentioned, um, these are our KPC evaluation team members. And again, as the day goes on and as the year goes on and as years go on, you will get to know each and every one of these individuals. We also provide opportunities to engage you even beyond the actual coalition work that you do. Uh, we have a number of different programs um, that we offer and um, we all work together, but many of these are done through WSU and community in the Community Engagement Institute. So the overarching scope of work for the KPC is to continue to work with youth and young adults in our areas, in our communities, in the state of Kansas, and to impact substance use prevention, substance use in our areas to reduce the number of youth and young adults who initiate um, the use of substances. Um, by definition, prevention is defined as anything up to when an individual is in need of treatment and recovery. So when you're thinking about what prevention means, um, think about the prevention isn't just for those youth that have never used substances at all, but also for those youth that we can catch um, that may have experimented, but, but we can educate and inform and encourage those youth to take another, and young adults to take another path um, other than substance use and to make healthier choices. Um, we ask in this program that you look at your data and that will be discussed later on today. Um, that's part of your scope of work is to look at your data and determine what, um, what are some of the overarching issues or concerns in your community that are specific to your community that you would like to focus on. And, and also looking at how you can engage your community, whether it be the school system, after school programs, community organizations, private organizations, to be able to spread the word as it relates to substance use prevention. You will hear a lot about the SPIF and the 12 sectors. Um, the SPIF is really this concept of being able to strategically plan out for the activities that you are doing in your work in coalitions. But you know, the one thing that I like to say about the SPIF is we we practice the SPIF every day. So you, I don't want you to get overwhelmed by this concept because the SPIF is utilized whether it is substance use prevention, whether it is in, in the health and medical field, uh, whether it's in our day-to-day -day lives. So um, again, more will be said about the SPIF as time goes on, but looking um, at this, you will see this again looking at the assessment, which is the stage that um, you are in right now, most of you are in right now, evaluation, then implementation, planning, and capacity, and always keep it in mind that you're looking at sustainability and ensuring that you have cultural competence as well. Also, as I meant, just, just mentioned a minute or two ago, we want to engage our 12 sectors. It would be wonderful if you could engage all 12 of these sectors in the work that you're doing as it relates to uh, bringing them into your meetings, bringing, inviting them to your events, um, having individuals at the table that can speak to um, what we're doing as it relates to substance use prevention. And again, you'll hear a lot about these 12 sectors um, later on. So grants and deliverables. <clears throat> in your partnership with KDADS and with the state of Kansas, uh, you will be receiving a contract 
in that contract will identify um, not only the scope of work, which I discussed earlier, but also the grant deliverables and reporting. In these deliverables, um, there will be um, a requirement to submit monthly financial fiscal reports, document in the community checkbox, uh, turn in monthly progress reports and, and quick checks, which we'll talk about later, um, work on your logic model, which includes, as I mentioned, looking at your data, um, looking at other factors in your community that are going to drive you um, to the focus of what you would be working on, and also the KPC action plans. Um, so these are very important um, aspects of your deliverables and reporting. The K the KPICI program is funded entirely by federal SAMHSA block grant funds. And so we are required to report to the federal government as it relates to the work that we're doing for the funding that we're receiving. So it is very important that we gather this information so that we are able to not only meet the outcome of providing this documentation, but also to show the federal government um, all of the great work that we're doing and how we're making a difference in our communities. So um, one thing that, uh, again, I'm setting the stage here, you will hear more from each of the individuals, but it is so important, as I mentioned before, it is so important that you document, document, document. And, and one thing that I wanna also stress as it relates to documentation is that as you learn more about the documentation, our system, the community checkbox, also provides you with the opportunity to create your own reports, um, to be able to, without you having to, to go in and, and piece together that data that you've collected, the things that you've done, it gives you an opportunity, you know, say for instance, you're meeting with one of your local representatives and you're like, man, you know, I, I need a one pager. Um, you know, the community checkbox provides you with the opportunity to create those reports. However, you can't create a report if there's nothing there. So it is so very important that you keep up to date and current on your documentation. It also assists us as your support team to be able to review the work that you're doing and provide any suggestions or feedback as to how you can continue to grow and continue to look at the needs of your community. And also looking at the Kansas Communities That Care student survey. We encourage all of our communities to have at least 60% participation um, on the Kansas Community That Care student survey. Um, there is a website and a link where you can educate yourself and also the officials at your school and administrators and principals on the importance of this data. This data is used, again, to be able to create those logic models to see the areas where our students are struggling and where, our, and, and where we need to focus our attention. The student survey is for sixth grade, eighth grade, 10th grade, and 12th grade, and you'll learn more about the survey later on today. We also um, want you to know that it's very, very, very important. Um, and we will ensure that you have your invites on your calendar so that you will be prepared to attend. Um, but it's very important that you attend the trainings um, that we um, offer. We offer both face-to-face -face trainings and online trainings. We will require that at least one individual from your coalition attend every training. Um, it's very difficult to uh, catch up on the information that you've missed um, by not attending a training. Um, and we also want to ensure that um, you know that it could be one person or it could be multiple people because sometimes it's difficult to translate what you learned in a training to other individuals. 
We really encourage the community mobilizer to attend these trainings, um, the individual who will um, be going out in the community and implementing the strategies and activities. But we, but we really um, encourage that as many individuals that can attend from your coalition um, to gain the knowledge that we're providing, um, you will have a, um, if you have not already received it in your packet, um, you will have a, a schedule of the trainings so that you can pr plan accordingly to attend those trainings and to actively participate in the trainings. At KDADS, as I mentioned, we are the single state authority for prevention. And so you will also, I'm not sure if you all have done introductions yet, um, but you will get to know uh, my team, um, Kitty and Alexis, um, who will be supporting you um, from the KDADS level. Um, when you're looking at your uh, logic models and, and your plans, um, those will be shared um, to us to review and approve. Uh, we really want you to work with your team at the KPC to come up with the, the best strategy that you can. Um, and, and we don't dictate that strategy per se, but we want to ensure that your strategies are in line um, with the KPC program and, and also are things that, that, we, that will move the needle on the initiatives that we are supporting. Um, we look at implementing with fidelity, uh, which means that we're looking to implement programs and strategies in our community that are evidence-based. Um, and, and that have some semblance of some history on being successful. That being said, um, we have been moving towards, and when I say we, as a country, as SAMHSA, we have been um, moving towards really looking at cultural competency and cultural awareness um, in an individualized setting. Each community is different. Each county is different. Each state is different. Um, so as you work through your logic model and looking at your strategies, we do have a process where if you are wanting to implement something um, that may need to be altered to fit your community, um, we have an open dialogue about that and a process to be able to tailor it to ensure that um, it's not just a cookie cutter implementation, that is truly an implementation that supports the needs of your unique community. So as I mentioned, our goal is to have 60% participation or higher um, in our schools um, that are participating in the KCTC survey. Um, we gather um, a lot of information that is totally anonymous, um, that includes anything from um, substance use or their thoughts and feelings regarding substance use, um, their feelings regarding their community, um, their feelings and, and thoughts um, as it relates to um, other types of situations within their community. Um, and so again, we'll talk more about that, but this data is so crucial. Um, without this data, um, it's very difficult to know where the areas are of concern and, and also to look at our progress as it relates to us implementing this program. How is it impacting our youth in our communities? So we really encourage those communities who may have um, schools that are not participating to, to have positive messaging re regarding participating in the KCTC. And, and also we will assist you in any way if for whatever reason that data isn't available to you. Signatures on documents. So this is going to be something that either you've experienced before or it's new to you. 
in this orientation, I like to set the stage for this because this is very important as it relates to your financial reports because um, I haven't talked about it yet, but this program is a reimbursable program. So that means that the, the funds have to be spent on the front end and then reimbursed the following month. And we will provide you with a financial form that calculates for you. And that form needs to be signed. If you are a coalition who has a fiscal agent, your fiscal agent will be responsible for signing these forms and submitting them. Um, if you if you're your own entity, um, then the individual that's assigned to sign these documents will be the ones um, to provide the signature and to submit these documents for reimbursement. The one thing that I want to stress is today um, is the easiest way to sign documents is electronically. Um, many of you don't go to a specific office. Many of you may work from home. Many of you may only go into the office one or two times a week. And so providing an electronic signature is acceptable. And the best way that I know to do it is um, Acrobat Adobe. So just a tip of the tips and tricks. If you don't have Acrobat Adobe with the signature, look into getting that. Um, and, and that will really assist you as time goes on. You could be on the beach in Tahiti and sign your document and get it sent in electronically. But what you should remember about this is electronic signatures are acceptable. So you don't have to print it out and sign by hand. I understand due to some limitations, um, exactly. Due to some limitations, that may be the only way and that's fine, but it will save you some time to use the electronic signature. Financial reports. So we talked a little bit of, about this. Um, this is a bit of my soapbox. So I want everyone to have their listening ears on as it relates to fiscal reports. Uh, first of all, our fiscal reports are due the 20th of every month for the previous month's expenses. We want one financial report or fiscal report per month. It is very important that these financial reports do not get backed up. Um, you know, we, we all learn from our experiences and some things that work well and things that did not work so well. I will let you know that getting back up on your monthly reports does not work well for a number of reasons. The first being, you wanna get your money reimbursed. Um, it's, it's quite difficult to run a program if you have no finances. Um, so that to me is the most important thing. We wanna ensure that you're receiving your reimbursement on a timely manner. The second thing is, as I mentioned, these financial reports calculate for you. So it provides you with the opportunity to be able to see where your spending is. I encourage all of you to have some type of internal mechanism to track your expenditures and your, your financials. Uh, we will not accept any QuickBooks or anything like that. We, we only accept our financial form. Um, but I tell individuals all the time, and you, even though you all are new and I don't want to scare you away, it's the truth. If we get audited, you get audited. So it's very important that you have some semblance of a mechanism to track your expenses and, and the, the reimbursements that you're receiving. So on that note, if you are behind on sending in your monthly report, it's really difficult to gauge for future months how much money you actually have available. 
because every month it will spin down to where you'll see, okay, this is how much I have for this month. This is how much I have for this month. Um, so there are so many rhymes to the reason why this is so important to us at KDADS that you turn your monthly reports in timely. One thing that I want to mention is, um, and this is being recorded so you can go back and look at, at listen to this and, and remember this. If you do not spend anything in a month, we still want you to send a financial report with zeros. Um, why would we want you to do that? Well, for the same reason that I mentioned before, if you keep track every month of what you spent and utilize that form to let you know, okay, I didn't spend any this month, so I still have this much left to spend. Um, it really helps you to stay organized and keep on top of um, your award amount and be able to know how much you have available to spend. Each coalition will have their own personalized spreadsheet with their own uh, budget that was submitted. And so that form is specific to you and your spending. So we ask, and you don't have to, you know, take everything that I say to memory today. We will continue and continue and continue to work with you on this. But the takeaway that I want you to take away from today is, please do not get behind in submitting your monthly reports. You can always have a conversation with myself, Kitty, Alexis, in regards to where you are with your financial report. Um, but you know, it's just like I say with my staff, if you don't turn in your timesheet, you're not gonna get paid. Well, if you don't turn in your monthly report, even if it's zero, cause that's a placeholder, even if it's zero, but if you don't turn in your financial report, you're not going to get reimbursed. And at this stage, as you're building your foundation for sustainability. You want to ensure that you have the funds reimbursed to you for what you spent to continue in your program successfully. The last thing that's very important that if you have a change in your fiscal agent or bank account, please let myself, Kitty, Alexis know as soon as possible. The state of Kansas has gone to um, really, I will say, insisting that all individuals have electronic deposits. Um, used to be a time where they would do checks and you know that worked for some people, but at this point, the Department of Administration is really, um, really focused on individuals having direct deposits. So that being said, you definitely don't want to change from X bank to Y bank and not let us know and your direct deposit goes to X bank when it should have gone to Y bank. So that being said, as soon, and, and you know, things change, things happen, things change. Um, but if you have any change in your bank account information, whether it be the bank, the bank account, the, the routing number, anything, the name of the individual on the account, please let us know ASAP. And that also applies to your fiscal agent. Your fiscal agent um, is the entity that is taking on the role and responsibility of collecting the funds that we reimburse and ensuring that the coalition uh, receives those funds to reimburse for the expenditures. Um, when the time comes where <clears throat> you no longer need a fiscal agent, then that, that process changes a bit. But the fiscal agent does take on ultimate responsibility for the funds that we are um, providing and reimbursing you on. So if you change fiscal agents, Again, sometimes that happens. 
um, just to make sure that your that you let us know as soon as possible because your contracts will have and will need to be signed by your fiscal agent. They are entering into this agreement with KDATS. This is an example of what your financial report will look like. As you can see um, on the left-hand side, it has all of the line items that you completed on your budget. Those numbers will be put into this form that will calculate every time you complete a, a financial report. So you'll have the budget, you'll have the current period, which means what did I spend in June that I now need to get reimbursed for in July, for an example. Um, that's not the way our fiscal year goes, but that's just what I thought about. Um, and then it will have the cumulative. So like I mentioned before, it, you'll be able to see, okay, in three months, I've spent this amount overall. And then it will also calculate your budget balance as far as to say, okay, this is how much I have left in this line item. The one thing to keep in mind is that we do not accept negatives in the line item. So say for an example, you budgeted $50 for equipment and you spent $60, which would give you a negative $10 balance. I'm impressed with my math. I'm a social worker, not a mathematician, but I think I, think I got that right. So um, what you would need to do, and we're not going to go into this a lot right now, um, but there will be a need for you to find that $10 somewhere else in your budget. I really encourage you all when you do your budgets year after year after year, that you try your best to really plan and ensure that your original budget is as realistic as it can be, that you put some thought into it. Again, we understand that things change and situations change and you're not gonna be penalized if you have to move that $10 from somewhere else. Um, but I will say that it is a process. It is not an easy process and it's not a quick process. Uh, many times individuals think, oh, well, I'll just, you know, call Kitty and tell her that I want to move $10 from, you know, uh, contractual to equipment. Easy peasy. Not so much. So as much as you can um, prepare your budget in a way that is reasonable and, and you feel will be the most representative of the budget that you need for that year, the better. Um, the last thing I'll say about this form is please always print your name and title, sign, and date your form. Um, again, this is this isn't something that you know occurs regularly. And sometimes I feel bad about it, but sometimes I'm like, well, we did I did the orientation, so I'm good, we're gonna send it back. Um, we cannot accept a form that does not have that information, which circles back to what I mentioned in regards to that um, electronic si signature if you're in Tahiti, because then all you have to do is just plug the your name and your title and your signature and the date in and send it to your behavioral health consultant for review and approval for your reimbursement. A lot of times, uh, one question that usually comes up is how long does it take to get our reimbursement? The general rule from accounting, and, and please understand that these funds do not come from KDATS. They're not paid through KDATS. They have to get sent on um, to the state agency that does all of the payments in the entire state. So the general rule is seven to 14 days. If you have not received your 
funds in seven to 14 days, you are more than um, welcome to contact one of us and say, hey, you know, just curious, um, haven't received my funds. We ask that you wait the maximum of 14 days before you do that, before you follow up with us, because we don't have any control over when that button gets pushed. Um, however, the general rule is, for an example, if you turn your form in on the 20th, unless there's something major going on, we're going to process it that day, if not the next day. Accounting processes it, I would say, around three to five days, and then seven to 14 days for the payment to come from the state of Kansas. And after my piece is, is over, I will uh, stand for any questions. I know that this is a, a lot of information. Um, and, and I want you all to know that, again, this is your orientation, just to get you familiarized. You When you turn in your first financial form, you may be like, what, what did she say? Electronic signature, Tahiti, I'm confused. <laughs> so just know that this is your introduction to this, but that we will assist you every step of the way. So <clears throat> just to recap, I've uh, spoken about a few of these things. So we're going to talk a little bit about do's and don'ts. So as far as do, as I mentioned, do ask questions. We are not afraid to, to get your questions, to answer your questions. Um, you know, you may say, well, who should I call? Should I call um, DECA? Should I call Stacy at DECA? Should, should I call Heather at WSU? Should I call Kitty? Who should I call? All of us are here and available for you. And if you reach out to one person, they're like, hey, you know, I'm glad you reached out. Good question. But you probably need to talk to Kitty. That's fine. I'd rather you contact the, the wrong person than not to ask the question at all. So please, please, please. Part of that also will include what is and is not allowable for expenditures through this grant. And so there are many times when a grantee, a KPICI coalition may say, well, can I spend money on, and this is just one example, can I spend money on getting pizza for our youth? The answer to that is no. Food is not allowable under this grant. However, if you didn't know that, then and didn't ask the question, then you would not know. So again, DECA will be uh, supporting you, will be supporting you in, in this uh, these efforts as you get started, but ask questions. As I mentioned, sign the fiscal report each month, turn the monthly financial report in, and fiscal and financial go hand in hand for anyone that's thrown off by that. It's the same thing. Monitor your budget, as I mentioned. Spend your full award. And for you all who, you know, aren't getting, you know, some of the, the larger awards, you know, getting started or what have you, you may think, spend your full award. I mean, they didn't even, even give us a lot of money. Um, you'd be surprised. The individuals that leave money on the table, I'm surprised myself. I think that part of that has to do with monitoring their budget. <laughs> I think that part of that has to do with maybe not asking questions about what they can and can't spend things on. There's a number of factors, but please don't overspend your budget. We can't pay you a penny more, but please plan on spending your uh, entire award. And as I mentioned, request budget changes as soon as possible. Don't. Don't manipulate the forms. And once you get your form, it'll make more sense to you. Um, but as we showed you, those forms are set up by accounting. They have the formulas already set in the forms. If you say, hey, well, I'm in Tahiti. And so I'm just going to white out 
what I did last month and just write in what I did this month and send it in, that's going to be detrimental because nothing is calculating correctly. Nothing is showing the the information that is needed from the budget to the current, to the cumulative, to the overall. So please do not manipulate the forms. If you find yourself in a situation where you're saying, this form doesn't work, I don't think it has the calculations in properly. Come to us and we'll look at that and talk to a county. Um, but please utilize the forms in the way in which they were sent to you. Um, change the previous monthly amount. So again, you know, we all sometimes are looking for those shortcuts because we only have so much time in a day. Um, so sometimes it may be a situation where someone says, okay, well, I'm kind of late turning in my monthly report. So I'll just take the one from August and just put September on the top of it. We're not going to play Jeopardy right now. So I won't say, ask anyone, why is that a problem? But let me just reiterate two things. The first thing is it's not going to calculate properly. The second thing is you, you may have a budget. Say, for an example, if your budget every month that you have spent out of your account is $200. I'm just making that up. $200. That's your expense every month. That's fine. But if you spent $210 in August and $250 in September, you can't just swap a, swap a month on the top of your form because that's not accurate accounting. And it's going to mess you up and it's going to mess us up uh, with your keeping with accounting. So this is not a situation where you can say, oh, I got this award. I'm going to divide it by 12 and I'm going to put that same amount every month. No, you have to put the amount that you spent, whatever that amount is, you have to put the amount that you spent to be reimbursed only. Um, do not combine monthly expenses. So sometimes the people think, okay, well, I'm behind, which none of you are going to get behind. But um, there have been situations, I'm talking about other people, other than you, other contractors, not even K-Picky coalitions, other people, that they're like, okay, well, we're behind. So we'll just send one financial report with September, October, and November combined. Hopefully, when I walk away from my podium today, the one thing that you will remember is that's not going to work. That's not going to report work, work for accounting purposes. It's not going to work as far as ensuring that your financial report calculates correctly. It, and it will be sent back. And we will ask that you create one separate report for each month. And then lastly, don't, which I don't even know if this is good grammar for all the teachers out there, but don't not ask questions. <laughs> don't not ask questions. My name is Deanne Armstrong, as I said before at DECA. Um, I'm just going to quickly breeze over this because you are going to hear this a lot. Stephanie already, re already referred to it some. Most of you are probably somewhat familiar or pretty familiar with the strategic prevention framework. You'll hear us call it the SPIF. Um, this is an evidence-based model for strategic prevention planning that all of your work is going to be based on as we go throughout the year. Um, the process is designed to help your communities to be able to build prevention capacity um, and infra infrastructure of your coalition um, that's necessary in order to go through this process to assess, to, um, to build the capacity around um, the needs in your community and around your strategic planning as you need um, different stakeholders to come to the table and be engaged. It really is a community-based process, so you need to get the community involved. Um, 
to plan. And then later, um, after this year, you'll have a whole year to go through this process with planning. And then you will have um, everything you need and ready to set up to implement successfully so that you can evaluate um, and sustain those effective prevention policies, practices, and programs that are going to reach those desired outcomes that you're hoping for. So the process works. I believe in the process. Um, and I hope that all of you do also. And um, it is, as Stephanie said, it's a natural process. It's something we do every day that we probably don't even think about. We, um, we go through this process quickly when we think about what we're going to wear, what meals we might make, uh, planning a vacation, or even just planning your day. So it really is um, a natural process and um, it can get cumbersome at times. Um, but we want to go back to that simplicity of it. It is data driven. Data is very, very important. You're going to hear about a lot of data here shortly. Um, as I mentioned, it is based on evidence and it was developed by SAMHSA, um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. It's been used for years and years and years and years um, to show really positive results. It's been tested, tried and true. Um, it's kind of like a business plan for your coalition's prevention efforts to making sure that you are working um, smarter and not harder, that you are more efficient because we all need efficiency in our lives. Um, we don't have a lot of extra time, money, resources. So we wanna use what we do have and use it wisely um, to get those results that we're hoping for without waste. Um, and this will help you to do that. You're gonna learn a lot more about the SPIF throughout this whole year and how to apply it throughout your strategic um, plan during those quarterly virtual trainings that Heather and I will be joining um, you with as long as some of your other support team members. You're also all going to be participating in that SAPS training at the end of August. Um, that is a strategic prevention framework application for prevention success. Um, those of you who have been around a while, you might have um, heard of SAPS with a, another name. There's been updates and changes to it. Um, and so they're keeping the same acronym, but that is the, the new name. So um, we're looking forward to spending um, four days with you all and really diving in and learning um, a lot more about SAPS and how to apply it with some fun activities as well. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. This is um, what you're gonna be learning about but it's really important to um, make sure that we are using this process to really assess um, your community. You have to have that data to be able to assess the needs of your community, the capacity of your coalition, the capacity of your community's readiness to engage in your efforts, um, as well as doing that needs assessment to be able to identify what are the problem areas in your community and um, what are those risk factors and that are driving that um, that action, that behavioral health issue that you identify? And then what are those evidence-based strategies that you can that match up and align that you can actually implement um, to make that progress? Um, that is how far you will get this year. Um, in this grant period, it's that planning. So at the end of the year, you will have that nice business plan for your coalition, that nice strategic plan that you'll be ready to implement, and it will have evaluation steps in it. You'll also be evaluating um, along the way as you evaluate your capacity and, and um, the actions that you're taking. Um, and as Stephanie said, always preparing for sustainability at the very beginning because we want your work to be able to sustain and your efforts to sustain over the long period, because we know these changes in your community um, don't happen overnight. Don't, don't, they don't happen in just a few years. They take um, that long sustainability effort in order to really make those long lasting changes. And of course, doing everything with cultural competence, we wanna make sure that there's inclusivity um, in all of our work. So we'll take all that into consideration. And I mentioned that already, and we took a break already. And I'm going to hand it over to Greenbush um, to talk about that data that is so important. And I will, um, I'll be back with you all later. So Lisa, I think I'm turning it over to you. Yes, thanks, Dan. So um, 
you know, we mentioned that we do data collection evaluation as part of the Kansas um, Prevention Collaborative. And part of that is the Kansas Community Care Student Survey, which you've heard a little bit about. We have different levels of, of knowledge and expertise within the, within the grantees uh, about the data. So I wanna start just by showing you a short video about the survey. It does a good job of talking about um, purpose and how the data is used by schools and communities. We see their faces every day. We're by their side as they succeed and sometimes struggle at school. But how well do we really know our students? What about what goes on outside of school? How do we know how to help them if we don't have a full picture of their challenges, as well as the positive influences in their lives? In Kansas, we're fortunate to have a powerful tool for measuring students' attitudes, thoughts, and behaviors. This valuable window into student life is called the Kansas Communities That Care Student Survey. They're not really willing to share a whole lot in class. I think that the survey is a great opportunity for the kids to feel safe in an environment, to sh really share how they feel, and for us as educators to get some really great feedback on things that maybe we're doing well and maybe some things that we need to work on a little bit better. The surveys to me are valuable because they give you the perception of the youth. We're not asking adults, we're asking the students themselves how they feel about the different substances or problematic behaviors. Since 1995, the Southeast Kansas Education Service Center at Greenbush has administered this nationally recognized comprehensive survey free to Kansas schools on behalf of the Kansas Department for Aging and Disability Services. Given to 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th graders, the survey looks at four areas of students' lives school, community, family, and peers. It monitors adolescent problem behaviors and the environmental factors that put young people at risk or protect them from developing those behaviors. It's nice to have the data for our coalition, for our community. Our problems are different than they are in Kansas City or Wichita or Topeka, so it's nice to have that data to relate directly to our communities. Schools like yours and others who help children rely on the survey to plan programs and activities and secure funding. As a building administrator, we take this data and we share the data with our staff, with our parents, with our site council, and with our safe and supportive schools committee. And with all those different groups, we are collaborating, trying to look at the data and saying what are the needs of our students. The staff at Greenbush provides year-round assistance at no charge, including website training, data analysis, customized reports, and guidance in using the information in your school. It's important that we as schools take this type of surveys for data collection. We know today it's all about data and so many of our schools and communities rely on some grant funding, particularly in the areas of safety, bullying, and drug and other prevention use. Unlike other student surveys, the KCTC is annual, making it easy to track trends, and Kansas was one of the first states to administer the survey. It was carefully designed and research-based for valid and reliable results. It has publicly available state and county data and password-protected district and building data. The information is easy to access and use. And the survey has high rates of participation, something state prevention providers are working hard to maintain. Today, our schools are always strapped for money, and we're also looking at how that we can maximize our students' potential. We know that this is a tool that has a long track record of building data that it can be then compared not only within our own building, but with a district, our county, and the state. The survey is also more comprehensive than most. You can find out answers to specific questions, monitor progress in certain areas, and even discover problems you were unaware of, such as the spike in prescription drug use or bullying. You'll find many uses for this important, anonymously provided information, including needs assessment, targeting resources, evaluating the success of programs, applying for grants, reporting, and PR and outreach. The data and reports are extremely useful to us. We use it in grant writing, grant reporting, we just received a major Drug Free Communities federal grant because our school district takes the CTC survey. That's their measurement. And Greenbush, we've worked with them to customize the data and reports for our needs. The survey looks at both negative and positive factors in students' lives. With all the time pressures on schools, why is it important to find out this information? Because research shows there's a direct correlation between these risk and protective factors and academic performance, including state assessments. Using reliable, current data, schools can channel their efforts into reducing risk factors and boosting protective factors. 
Education changes and evolves all the time, but one thing is always true. Your time and resources are limited. This survey is a useful tool to help you with annual assessment, evaluation, and strategic planning. If you talk to uh, most schools, they, they are not afraid to invest money in scouting football teams to see what the other team is doing. They aren't afraid of checking on their own data and their own players on the 40 time of their bench press. They have no idea what their behaviors are outside of school with alcohol, drugs, bullying. Here's an opportunity for free, it doesn't cost a dime, to be able to look at what's happening with things that are going to directly affect these kids' lives that are going to have much more impact on their life than their bench press. If you haven't given the survey in your district, or have but didn't know how to put the results to use for you and your students, please contact the team at Greenbush. If you have, thank you. On behalf of all the students and families who have been helped, when our young people get the support they need, the entire community benefits. Your participation is critical. Our schools make this survey possible. We hope you'll help keep this valuable resource going strong. For more information or to register, go to kctcdata.org. So I think that video does a really nice job of explaining the survey, again, the purpose, how the data is used, and it can be a really good recruitment tool if you're trying to tell people, again, why the survey is important uh, and how it benefits uh, the schools and the communities. So we'll talk about where to find uh, access to that in a little bit so that you can use it uh, and refer people to it as well. So in addition to the Kansas Communities That Care Student Survey, we at Greenbush or Learning Tree Institute also support data collection and evaluation related to the Kansas Young Adult Survey. And this is a survey that's a random sample survey of uh, those 18 to 25 in Kansas, and not just universe, not just college students, but it's those in college and not in college. And this is a this is a hard to reach population. So we're really lucky to have this data uh, on an annual basis. It is only at the state level. So we're not going to get to be able to get down to a county or kind of school, any kind of school or regional area, but it does provide some information that we wouldn't have otherwise about this population. And young adults is a population of focus for the K-Picky and for K-Dads uh, becoming more so. So knowing what happens to, to kids once they leave high school, this gives us our snapshot. So um, I encourage you to find out more about this and I can can show you kind of where that's located. Just you can go to www.kyas.org and it's on the actually on the KCTC site. Um, and it looks and feels a lot like the KCTC website. So we do support that data collection as well. And then um, also the Kansas Behavioral Health Indicators Dashboard. And this is a, a dashboard of data that really kind of delves into more what's happening within a community, within a county. Um, things that might be contributing to what we're seeing with related to substance use uh, with youth and young adults. So it looks at, at, at crime, income and poverty, substance use, not just with kids, but also with adults and some mental health and, and a little bit of treatment data. So that's another, it's just www.kbhid.org. So those are some things that you'll be learning more about again throughout this planning year and how to use this data. Uh, just to reiterate, you know, this KCTC, it's where we, we talk about this a lot because it is the main source of outcome data for the KPICI grantees, both needed for needs assessment and also determining outcomes. So it's for 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th grade. It doesn't cost anything to the school districts. And our goal is to have 60% or higher um, to ensure high quality data. When you do go on to the website, this is the homepage. This is what you'll see on the landing page when you go to kctcdata.org. It has a registration button. We have open registration earlier this year. It's starting September 2nd. Uh, part of doing that is to help schools um, meet their uh, parental consent requirements of having uh, consent signed within four months of administering the survey. So um, that's been helpful. And this is what you see on the landing page. And if you go to the button there, it says view survey results. When you click on that button, when you go to view survey results, you'll see this, this site. And you can select on the upper left, you can select your county that you want to go to. This, for example, has Allen County selected. And then underneath that, there's a number of different categories that uh, it has every substance listed in a drop down that you can choose. 
And it also has the four domains that we talked about in the video. So things related to school, family, community, and then peer individual domains. Yeah, so if you click there, and let's say we clicked on alcohol, you would get every question there was related to alcohol. And there's a lot. It's not just what's on this screen. It goes on for several more pages. Um, but in this example, we're going to look at is we're going to click on that second one down, which is 30 day prevalence on how many occasions, if any, have you had beer, wine or hard liquor in the past 30 days. And so when you click on that, this is what you'll see. And this is what you see when you click on any of the questions. You'll have a comparison of the county in the light blue and it, uh, how, how it compares to the state in the darker blue. So in this case, you can see a trend and you can go back to select you, know, you have options of selecting from different years. Uh, you have options of selecting whether you want to look at sixth grade individually, eighth, tenth, twelfth individually, or all together, or even a snapshot of middle school, which is sixth and eighth combined, or high school, which is tenth and twelfth combined. So this is just an easy, nice visual way that you can say, oh, I see this is trending down. Uh, and for this county, they're lower than the state average. So it's an easy way to navigate a lot, a lot of data. You can check participation rates for any particular county or for the state. And this is important as you're trying to keep track of um, where, where are we at? Where have we been? What is what is our what do we might might need to increase our, our participation, especially as we're going into the new Cape Pick year? And the next click shows there's a number of different uh, reports and, and different graphs for you. This one I wanted to point out because it's past 30 days substance use. And if you click on that for any given county, it'll show you in one, one snapshot all of the substances that are asked on the, on the survey and it rank orders them from highest to lowest. So you can see that the number one, uh, the most prevalent um, substance use reported was for alcohol, followed by vaping, binge drinking, marijuana, and so forth. So again, rank ordering, it just kind of makes a nice way that you can kind of uh, just visualize that easily. The other nice thing about the website is for every single question that's asked, you have an option of clicking on a state map. So this kind of shows you where you are in your county compared to those counties around you uh, and to the state. And it also helps to kind of show where there's maybe some potential hotspots or high prevalence areas within the state that you can look at. And when you since, uh, when you click on one of the counties, it'll show you the trend. It'll have a pop-up that shows you the trend and state comparison. So you can see, okay, I'm, I'm somewhere close to what's happening around my region or my, my adjacent counties or potentially not. So we're going to need data. This is the, the SPIF is a data-driven process. It, you know, we don't want to just guess what's happening in our community. May, we may think we know what happens, but we really need data to, to tell us, to support that. And so you're going to need data in the assessment page of the SPIF when we're going to be looking at uh, our community reports. There's a KCTC community report that, that's going to look at all of your risk factors and all of your substance use. It'll help you identify what might be driving substance use within, within your community. So we need data to assess, assess risks and to prioritize uh, our needs. We're going to need data during the implementation phase to know what's working and if things aren't working, what we need to change uh, to make things to make things better. We don't want to wait to the very end and say, oh, what we did didn't work. We need to monitor during implementation as we go along and make changes and adjustments as needed. But you need data to show if what you're doing is having an impact. And then finally, also in evaluation. Did we meet our, our objectives? Did we meet our goals? Do we have data? What is our trend showing this happens during the implementation of, of three years down the road? So again, data is very important and we all know that, um, particularly for this grant. Um, with regard to KCTC, just this gonna gives you a snapshot of participation. We have had a little reduction in participation um, because of some of the new legislation that has made um, consent uh, requirements a little bit more difficult to obtain. So, as I mentioned, you have to have the consent, parent consent within four months of administering the survey. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But even so, even with some of those constraints, we still have, um, I like showing this map because it shows it is a statewide survey. It's not just representing one pocket or one corner of the state. 
it is it is pretty well distributed, varying levels of participation, um, but but it is well distributed across the state. We had close to thirty three thousand students of of eligible of the sixth, eighth, tenth, and twelfth. Those are the eligible students. Thirty three thousand students last year. So uh, schools are navigating, learning how to navigate the consent procedures, and we're trying to assist with that by opening window administration window a little bit earlier and so forth. So um, that begs the question though, what happens when my community doesn't have data? What if we don't have good data? You know, our goal is 60% or higher. Um, and one of the things that will require for this grant is if you don't have that, if you're not already at that 60%, is that you would complete a KCTC action plan and that's just uh, it's outlining some steps you're going to take as a coalition to try to increase your rate or to try to recruit schools to participate. Uh, and and we'll, again, that'll be one of the first things you do. As I said, the uh, registration or the administration starts in September. So we'll need to get on this right away for those that need it. And just outlining steps. And we'll talk about what are those, some of those steps are in a minute. And for those that don't have data right now, there are a couple of coalitions that do not have KCTC for this last year. We are working uh, as a team to find some ways to help you uh, be able to do a needs assessment uh, in lieu of having some of that data. So we'll be working with you individually on that and in the next training coming up in August uh, related to assessment. So ideas to increase participation. So some things to consider to add into your KCTC action plan. Um, first is sending a letter uh, from the coalition. Get get some letterhead and, and type up a letter and let people know, hey, we've got a new grant. We've got some funding for our community that's going to benefit our community, going to benefit our kids. Um, we would really uh, like your help. One way you can help is to sign up for this survey. This is how we get our data and, and measure our success. So sometimes that direct outreach to coalitions, um, from coalitions to school administrators, can make a big difference. Schedule a meeting with school administrators, again, to tell them, hey, this is this is important to us. We hope you'll consider taking the survey if you're not already signed up. Here's the website. Here's the video. Share the video with them and say, we don't expect you to be an expert on the survey, but you don't have to be. We have brochures and videos that you can share. And then another really important thing is to make sure you have um, representation from schools on your coalition. They can act as a really great liaison between the coalition and school administrators many times. So that we talked about that sector representation, school school representation is very important for, for your coalition. And then just continue to just discuss uh, you and use the data. If you do have it, use the data um, to again, show support for the survey and how the data can be used for your coalition. Um, the hands down, the number one way, the best way to get once you, once their schools have agreed to sign on is to get the consent form in enrollment packets because that's when parents are already signing forms. Um, and so that's been the best way to get those consent forms signed. Sending out the forms, if, if not in the enrollment packet, sending them out two weeks before the survey and sending email, text, or voice alerts to remind parents. Again, that's gonna probably have to come from your work with the schools, but those would be some suggestions that you could do to increase the participation uh, with parents. There's, there's a community tab where you can learn more about it and click again. There's another where it says see reports. There are a number of predefined reports on there for communities. And one of them, as I mentioned, is the KCTC community report which instead of having to go find everything yourself on the website, it does a nice job of showing you prevalence for the main substances, showing you risk factors and comparing uh, whether it's higher or lower than last year or higher or lower than the state average. So some nice reports can be found uh, on this site. One more click, Chad. And then on this, there's also um, a brochure and where you can find the video. So when you do click on that bottom arrow, this is what you'll see, and you'll see the video there. So that's where you can find the video. And then that download that it has there is a brochure that you can also print and take 
you take with you to your to your coalition members to keep them uh, to to inform them or make them aware to your uh, school administrators to the school board or anyone that you're you're working with to try and um, again increase awareness of the survey and the the need for data um, not just for this grant but data is very important for getting other funds as well and to you know needed to monitor your progress and, and evaluate how things are going and I think that's all I have right now um, we'll be again talking more about about the survey and data throughout this whole process so thank you turn it over to KU now uh, thank you, Lisa Chat. Uh, I'll now continue with our part of presentation. It's Leila again from KU CCHD, and I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, the purpose of uh, today's presentation in our part is to provide a high-level overview of our center support and tools. Uh, we will be providing in-depth uh, training for you guys in less than two weeks, uh, scheduled uh, July 24th. As you can see, and it was mentioned earlier, KUCCHD is another um, evaluation partner, KPC evaluation partner alongside Greenbush, supporting data collection, data analysis, and evaluation through the following tools, uh, Workstation, uh, which is uh, known uh, with the WST acronym, and um, Community Checkbox Evaluation System uh, with the CCB acronym, which you will be hearing a lot soon. Uh, and we will take a closer look at uh, each of them in following slides. Workstation or WST is uh, actually a communication hub for KPK grantees. Uh, it is a um, SharePoint site just to retrieve information, uh, deliverables, document, or respond to you know contractor reports and any kind of communication uh, communication you might need it. Um, here is the screenshot of the KPK W uh, workstation. Actually, you see three buttons in the middle of the page, and some tabs at the top of the page, and some slide links uh, on the left side. Uh, sorry, on the right side. But uh, when you get on this page with your account. Uh, you will see only one link on the top and uh, your specific collision link on the sidebar uh, because of the access limits. So don't worry if you uh, will not be able just to see all these tabs and link. Uh, you will see the KP key tab uh, with a, a small drop down menu uh, where you will find a CCB link. Uh, and this link will take you to the CCB main page or landing page, which I'll uh, show you in the next slide. But uh, like I said, uh, in terms of the uh, sidebar, it is where you will upload or download all required documents such as your deliverables like the action plan, logic model, monthly reports, and any other like the materials or report you need uh, to work uh, looking forward, moving forward. Uh, uh, like I said, um, if you uh, hit the KP key, um, uh, tab, it takes you to this page, which is the um, CCB dashboard page or landing page. Um, in a short, CCB is an online monitoring tool that help user record, measure, report the efforts, allowing them, uh, allowing them just to understand and track they progress in accomplishing the preventing program over the time. Uh, here in this screenshot of CCB dashboard page, you can see three buttons uh, or three tabs at the top, 
graph, view data, inter data. Um, inter data tab is probably the most applicable tab for you guys when you start documenting. Um, and uh, when you click on this tab, I mean, inter data tab, it takes you to the accomplishment form which is the, uh, the important, probably the most important document you need to complete uh, weekly moving forward. Here is a visual of the, like the accomplishment form. Uh, this, uh, this form is specifically uh, designed to capture all details of your preventing effort or activity you have done, you are uh, getting done. Um, it consists of, sorry, same uh, previous slide uh, chat, yeah. It consists uh, of five main domains, as you can see in the figure uh, with some uh, subdomains. This includes um, the like the five main domains of this form include grantee identification, uh, accomplishment description, categorization, media application details if applicable, and all the details related to the program participation description. Um, so we will provide in-depth guidance on how to complete this form in our upcoming training and uh, because it definitely takes time. So don't worry and um, we're going to get back to this, all the details and dig into this form uh, on 24th. Uh, in terms of the what to document in this form, in the accomplishment form, as a general rule, uh, you need to document any tangible or meaningful activities or effort you made toward um, achieving your uh, goal, prevention and uh, program goal, but uh, you can always use this uh, cheat sheet. Uh, as a reference, um, which, you know, help you just to make sure um, you don't miss any of your preventive effort to be documented. Um, this, like the cheat sheet, is available in Workstation, uh, as I referred the link uh, in this slide. Um, here is a list of some reports that are generally that are generated periodically uh, by using CCB data, uh, such as the monthly performance reports. I mean your performance uh, over the time, fidelity report, KDATS or KP key partners related or requested report, and NOM, uh, a national outcome measure, which is a very uh, important federal level report. So you can see and understand um, by accurately and consistently entering data into CCB, you contribute to the generation of the disvaluable and important reports. Uh, which play uh, really uh, which can help all decision maker uh, or a stakeholder on the you know um, evaluation assessment and uh, project or initiative. Here I stop and pass it over to Shelby uh, to continue. Hey everyone, um, I'm just going to go over the um, kind of like what your months are going to look like uh, regarding the CCB. Um, so Chad, there's a couple of, uh, yep, we got it. Perfect. Um, so weekly, um, that's documenting in the CCB, like using that accomplished form, accomplishment form, like Layla mentioned. Um, and just as a side note, um, to echo Layla and also to, uh, echo Deanne, um, we're going to have a more in-depth training of how to enter into the CCB. Um, I know it looks daunting. I know it can be like a little overwhelming like, at first, but I promise you, you will get it into Echo Kitty as well in the comments. Um, Layla and I will be here to support you in any way you need uh, entering into the CCB. Um, but uh, going into back to the tasks, um, just make sure that if you have something like you, um, you, you met for a meeting or you met with a new partner or you decided you had a new partner um, or just 
uh, or, or you have an actual event, which is awesome. Um, just make sure you uh, get that into the CCB. We recommend entering weekly, um, just so everything just stays fresh in your mind when you enter. Um, and then monthly, um, on the 15th, I will um, email out a link to your um, monthly progress reports. It's basically just a report that's a snapshot of um, what you entered into the CCB that month and how it aligns to your um, logic model and um, action plan and just uh, to show, and it's a nice way of showing like, hey, this is what I did this month or hey, this is like what we've accomplished so far. Um, so that's on the 15th of the month. Um, and then I, in the I monthly reports, there is a link to the quick check. Um, the quick, quick check is, um, uh, what Greenbush covers, and um, you'll just click on that and make sure that you have your monthly report reviewed by the 25th so you can complete your quick check for fidelity, fidelity purposes. Uh, I think there's one more um, transition. Yep. And then this is a new thing that we were implementing this year, Greenbush and KU. Um, monthly on the first Thursday of the month, uh, there's just going to be a short 10-minute fidelity CCD feedback check-in call um, just to make sure everyone is on pro is is on track and making progress towards community change. And I believe that is the last part of my slide. I'm gonna hand it over to Deanne at DECA again to go over the next section. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so assessing capacity, um, you're gonna get started right away. I know you, um, you, you've had this grant now for um, it's 11 days into the grant year, and you might be thinking, what, what should we be doing? Um, so I'm going to give you some information on what you should be doing. Um, Lisa already gave you some information about the Kansas Communities That Care Student Survey, so you can start encouraging um, participation and thinking about what actions you can take as a coalition to increase that. Um, but there's also assessing for capacity. And so I'm just going to quickly share with you, you're going to get a lot more information about this, um, but you're going to use the Kansas Communities at Care and other data that um, Greenbush is going to help you to identify and to collect in order to complete your needs assessment to identify those priority, um, priority areas of substance misuse to target along with those influencing factors. Um, but you will also need to collect some other types of data for assessing and planning for how to build capacity, because we know we need capacity in order to move forward with planning. So as your coalition begins assessing capacity, you'll be looking at two different assessments, um, the capacity of the coalition and the community readiness. Um, I know some of you were um, introductory grantees last year, and you have um, participated in a triethnic community readiness interviews um, and already have done some of that assessment, but there are others who haven't, so more training to come on that. What I want to zero in on right now is the other assessment, assessing your coalition's capacity. Um, both of those together um, are assessing for capacity, but we're really going to zero in on this coalition capacity. This is an online survey, and Greenbush is um, has created this, and they have a link um, to a survey that you are going to be using to send out to all of your current coalition members to be able to have a baseline and to be able to identify um, what are the gaps, what are things that are going well, what are the strengths of the coalition, so we can um, help you to have conversation around what can we do to be better, what can we do to work on to build capacity, strengthen the infrastructure and the strength of our coalition um, so that we can build capacity and move forward. So this is what the um, survey looks like if once you get that link. I would encourage you all to go ahead and um, take it yourself so that you know how, um, how to promote it to your coalition members. So this is just what that first page will look like. 
The survey is a tool to measure um, many aspects of the coalition's ability to plan and implement prevention strategies. The survey is divided into these sections that reflect the diverse aspects of the coalition's capacity. So each different section, as you see on the screen there, um, we'll be able to have some data and some measurements to be able, and, and questions underneath that you're going to be able to really dig into and zero in on. The survey will identify strengths and weaknesses, as I said, in each of these areas, and you'll use that data to create a capacity building action plan um, to identify what actions you can take as a coalition in order to build capacity. So this is the process that begins today. Greenbush will be sending out a link for the survey that will be sent out today if it hasn't already. Um, and I'm not sure, Lisa, if that comes directly from you, but you'll be looking for a Greenbush um, email. Yes, uh, their, their evaluators, their assigned evaluators will send out the link with the coalition link, uh, a note with coalition, coalition link on it. Awesome. So you also get to start making that connection about who from Greenbush is your, I mean, any of them will help you. Um, they're all great people and they're going to answer your question, but you're going to have a specific assigned support person that's going to be um, detailed and know the details of your specific community. So look for that and make that connection that, that where that link is coming from is your support person from Greenbush. So if you have any questions, concerns, you can reach out to them. Um, you then will be asked to send out uh, that link to all your coalition members. You might want to think about what wording you put with that um, to help them to understand why they're getting this link um, and what that participation means to the, um, to the coalition and what that work is going to be, the purpose of the, the coalition. Um, and then halfway through, Greenbush will provide an update to let you know how many have participated so far. So you can kind of gauge if you want to push it out again um, or if you're satisfied with the participation at that point. And that will all happen, as it says on the screen there, um, um, on the dates provided there. The survey will close on July 30th then, and Greenbush will then provide a report that has all of the results, very easy to read and to use. I'm gonna show you a copy of what that looks like and how to use that. Um, we're also going to be giving you a, a guide. It's kind of like a workbook to help you to work through um, analyzing that data and how to engage your coalition in the conversation. And we'll cover all of that um, in that August 5th um, SPIF content training that we have um, scheduled. Everyone should have um, already received a link about calendar invite with a link. If anybody does not, has not received that, please reach out to me right away. So this is just a copy of a sample of a report um, that you will get back from that coalition capacity survey once it's complete and Greenbush has the time to, um, to um, calculate all of that. They're gonna put together a report for each separate community. The report will look something like this. And this would be um, each dimension that we mentioned that it's gonna be having um, the different questions underneath it. So this is the dimension covering vision, mission and goals. These are the questions that would be asked of all of your um, coalition members. And you're gonna pay attention, especially to that last column where um, they've combined th questions um, or the, the highest rating three and four. And those are the ones that we're going to, to pay attention to. On this particular example, this was a coalition that is, um, has taken the survey before. So they not only have the baseline um, for the, um, when they started in 2020, but then they have this year's um, results as well. You will only have one column at the end there for just your baseline information for the 2024 data, but this is a survey that's given every year. So then the following year, you will have baseline compared to the current year. So you'll be able to easily see um, where you've made strides and where maybe you might, might have um, more work to do. And so 
um, this will be really easy to, um, to look at and to very useful information here. Then this is a worksheet that's in the SPIF guide that we will be providing to you. And we'll be talking about that and how to use this, um, this workbook, this guide um, at our August 5th meeting. But this is a worksheet there that you're going to be able to put your information in about um, all the different dimensions once you get that report. So you can help, it helps you to analyze what are the highest, what are the lowest. And then it'll also have some questions that you can have with um, your coalition members to spur up some conversation and be able to identify what are some actions that you would like to take um, in order to increase those areas that you might have some low areas in and how do we celebrate um, the strengths of the coalition and make sure that we continue those things. So all of that will be covered again August 5th. So just a summary, the grant requirements um, as Shelby talked about, there'll be monthly progress reports um, that she's going to be completing the 15th of every month for the previous month's community checkbox entries. Um, she'll also send out an email letting you know when those reports have been completed. They will be in your folders on the workstation. Um, again, we will go over that again in our training on how to navigate, where to find all of that. Um, and they'll also, I believe Shelby um, also includes a link to where to find it when she sends out those emails so that you can easily um, access them. In that report each month, there at the end of it, there is a link that will take you to um, some quick check questions. I'm going to show you what those are in a minute here. They're very easy, very quick um, to be able to answer. They shouldn't take probably more than you know, five minutes at the most, depending on if you have something that you want to uh, share about and how much you want to include in that report. Um, but you'll need to complete those by the um, 25th of that month after the, um, after the report from Shelby has been reviewed on the 15th, then you will have 10 days to complete that quick check link. Stephanie, I see your hand up. Yes. Um, this slide was not updated. We apologize, but please keep in mind, as we've discussed, um, the monthly financial reports are due on the 20th. Um, you will also be able to reference your contract, which will say the 20th. So I don't want to get anyone confused. Um, this says the 10th, but it wasn't updated. So it is the 20th of each month. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Thank you. I was wondering about that and I didn't know which one was the right um the right date. So thanks for that clarification. It never hurts to to be to get them done early though, right? I mean, if you get them done by the 10th, nobody's going to slap your hand or anything. Um, okay, then. Okay. <laughs> thanks, Stephanie. Um, also is, is a requirement to attend the required trainings. It says here at least one representative, but you can have many representatives. Um, the more that you have there, that helps with sustainability, helps with better understanding and engagement with your coalition. So we highly encourage you to invite others to attend any of the trainings. Um, and also, you know, it, it sometimes can be a little deceiving when it says one person has to attend. Really, you want that person to be the person that is going to um, need that knowledge and is going to use the knowledge gained in that training to move your coalition forward. So it is really important to have the right people there and also to be able to communicate the information that you're getting um, with others. So just keeping that in mind. Um, Stephanie already talked about the financial reports on the 20th that are due um, each month. There, um, the KU folks, Layla and um, Shelby both talked about the weekly checkbox entries. Um, it's really a good habit to get into just to put those in weekly. You might only have, you know, one or two a week and those are real easy to enter. If you get behind and you have a whole month to enter, it takes a lot more time and you have to go back and remember those details. So I um, really encourage you to, um, to abide by that and get those done weekly. More to come on that, so don't worry about it, don't panic. And then you will have deliverable documents that will be done towards the end of the planning grant year. And they will consist of a logic model, which is your coalition's business plan in a snapshot. 
um, and in action plans. I'm going to show you what those look like here in just a minute. In the action plans, it is one document, but it includes what plans you're going to take in order to encourage um, participation in the Kansas Communities That Care survey, especially if your community's participation level has been less than 60%. As, as was already mentioned, is a requirement to um, complete that part, that portion of the action plan on what action steps the coalition is going to take. Then there's the capacity plan, which you're going to use that data for the capacity assessment, the coalition survey that we talked about that's being sent out today, as well as the community readiness interview scores on assessing how ready the community is to engage in your um, in your effective prevention work. And then um, sustainability plan that will training will come specifically to you later on that and um, we'll be giving out more information about that. But we do think about sustainability from the very beginning because you want to sustain every part of your uh, SPIF process. This is a quick look at those quick check questions. I'll just give you a moment to look at those. You don't need those to me to read those to you. This is a time when you can share your story. You can um, tell us um, what you're what you're experiencing. What are things that you're proud of? What are you excited about? Or what are your challenges? And this will give us an opportunity to the whole support team later when we get your report back to be able to see those things so we can identify if there is challenges that we can help with. We want to make sure and act upon that. Um, of course, you're always also the communication lines are open for you to reach out to any of us anytime um, to be able to help you with any TA needs. We don't have to wait for the report. This is just a copy of what the logic model looks like. This is that snapshot where in column one, it will be after you've gone through your needs assessment, you will put your um, your priority problem area that you've identified by using the data. Um, that you're going to be targeting, the risk and protective factors that are um, influencing that problem area, your evidence-based strategies, and your long-term goals. Um, you're going to get lots of training on this, so I'm not going to elaborate on that much. Just This is just what it looks like. Quick overview. This is what the KPC action plans look like. Um, this is the KCTC participation, increasing participation, the capacity building action steps will be taken. Um, this one we'll talk about later. It's about the health disparity. We'll talk all about that later. Don't worry about it now. Um, and then you'll have a place for each strategy from your logic model um, and what action steps you're going to take. So that's a quick snapshot, just a quick look at those deliverables that are going to be due. And this is the a copy of the training schedule just for the first quarter. Um, as Chad said, he's going to be sending out that schedule um, to everybody, so you'll be able to have it. Um, also, I just would encourage you, I just noticed myself today that when those um, invitations come out, if you receive one, make sure if there's somebody that's missing from your coalition that, or your um, any partners that you want to receive that invitation, feel free to forward that on to them. Um, so to make sure that everybody's getting the information that you need for all of the trainings. And um, as mentioned, any questions, issues, concerns, please reach out to someone. There is someone that will you will have <laughs> their contact information and we'd be more than willing to assist you. The last thing is I want to encourage you, Georgina put in the chat about Prevention Works. Um, Any time you can engage with our community as it relates to prevention is wonderful. And so we encourage you to attend our Prevention Works. We also encourage you to attend my favorite time of year, which is our conference, which will be in October. And when you're looking at your budgets, when you're looking at what you are going to be doing as far as travel, 
please keep that in mind. Please talk to your DECA representative or your KDAS representative if you have any questions or issues regarding that. I look forward to meeting all of you in person at either Prevention Works, the conference, or both. We're going to get to know each other very well, and I look forward to that. For those of you who are continuing on, thank you for staying with us. Um, for those that are just starting, again, welcome. And, and we look forward to many years to come working with you. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Chad and let him know if there's anything else we need to do before we let these great people go on with their day.